For those of you who are with us for the first time, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And, and you have to understand, right now, we are in the midst of a journey called home. And, and we believe that God's called us to do something really powerful inside of our city, that he's called us to be able to establish a space from which we're able to love, not, not just on Sundays, but all week long. And so we've begun this journey and asked God to not just do something through us, but to do something in us, to uproot us from the places where we've found home before so that we truly can, so that we truly can find our home entirely in him, that, that we, can, we can live life with, with him and him alone being our source of identity, security, our home. And so for the past couple of weeks, we've, we've been on this, on this journey. If you have your study guide with you, you can pull that out. If you don't have one of these study guides, as we go out today or even now, you can jump to one of the connection points there in the back, and we have copies of these there for you. But as, as we jump into it, for the last couple of weeks, we've been, we've been looking at the life of this man named Abraham. For those of you who don't know, Abraham is a phenomenally significant historical figure and is an individual where God so perfectly pictures and so perfectly illustrates this idea of finding home. Because in Abraham's life, God literally steps in and he uproots him. He takes him from his current home and he takes him to a new home, which at first looks like it's about a place. But as we've seen, it's not about a place. It's about a person. It's not about somewhere. It's about someone that God wants for Abraham to find his home in him. And so we've been walking through this journey and asking God, okay, God, we want for you to do the same in us and just looking at how God did that with him. Today, we want to continue that journey. And as we do, we're going to walk into one of the most complicated stories in all of Abraham's story. It's a story that actually for many of you, you may have come to and, and rather than continuing the story, it may have been the end of you reading through Abraham's story. Because when you look at it just on, a, on its face, when you just read through it quickly, it, it's incredibly confusing and, and, in, and in many ways alarming. Now, now, at this point in Abraham's story, not only has he left his home and found himself in a new place, but he's worked through the things that we've been talking about. And so he's learning to trust God's plan, not his plan. He's stepping in and giving God priority. And, and, and we saw last week how that meant stepping into generosity in this unique way with, with Lot. And he's working through all this. And now he's actually, he's actually had his son, Isaac. And, and, the, and the promised child has been born. And so Abraham is finally beginning to realize everything that God's been promising him. That, listen, I'm going to take you to this new place, and I'm going to turn your family into a nation. And they're not a nation yet, but at least there's one, which is encouraging based on where they used to be. And remember how impossible it was that there would even be one. But finally, Isaac has been born. And then this happens. Let me, take you to, let me take you to the story. It's found in Genesis chapter 22. It starts off and it says this. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now here, this, this actually speaks to Abraham's state of mind because this actually means, and it's original, it's not just a location thing. He's not saying, okay, I'm over here. He's, what he's, this is the way that you would respond to a master. This is the way that a servant would respond to a master. And, and so it's, it's also a sign of submission. He's saying, okay, here I am. In other words, I'm ready. I'm excited. What do you want for me to do? Where are you leading? What's next? He's experienced God's faithfulness so much up to this point. He's seen God's promise promise come true. And so he's like, okay, okay, God, here I am. Here I am. What's, what's next? And then listen to what it says. It says, then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. I will tell you about. What? What? Like, like I said, for some of you, this is where you stopped reading Abraham's 
story. Wait, 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 wait. What did you just say? God said to do what? For some of you, this may even be one of the reasons why you haven't been to church in 20 years. I mean, you heard this. This is, this is insane. And, and listen to me. If you're not thinking that, you're not being honest about the story. And unfortunately, sometimes we read through these stories and, and we're, we're not honest about it. And, and so you're reading through Genesis and you read, you know, okay, take your son, your only son, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Okay, that seems normal. And then you just keep, and then we just keep going. Like it's a natural, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I accept that. That's cool. No, like what in the world is going on? That is a natural response. And for those of you who are here who have read that or heard that, and sometimes we just get like the 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 the, the head headline of this rather than actually being able to see the whole story of it. But you heard that and you said to yourself, that's insane. I can't believe that. And some of you didn't even know that it was in there. And then you invited your friend today and you're like, this was not the day. This was not the day to invite them. And you're, you've already leaned over them. It's not usually like this. I didn't know that was in there. I don't know what's happening right now. And the truth is, you should respond that way. You, you, you should respond with, what in the world is going on? And, and listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. God doesn't need you to look past the truth in order to trust him. And he doesn't need you to skip past this story in order to trust him. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, this story, it radically changes the way we trust him. Listen to how it continues because it's interesting. God, God says, okay, Abraham, this, this is what I want for you to do. And Abraham responds. Listen to what it says. It says, early the next morning, Abraham, the next morning, not not." A week later, not three weeks later, the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. God says, Abraham, this is what I want for you to do. And Abraham says, Okay, and again, if you're going to be honest about it, you're thinking, what in the world is happening? But this is one of those places, listen, listen, this is one of those places where context is incredibly important. One of those places where you have to understand you have to understand the culture and the context in which Abraham finds himself. So let me ask you, let me ask you a question. As we look at, at the story, as we look at Abraham's response, let me ask you, why wasn't Abraham surprised? Why doesn't, why doesn't he even respond back and say, wait, 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 what, 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 what? You're, you're asking me to do what? Why wasn't there even any kind of clarification on what, okay, what he's asking him to do? Why is it just, okay, this is what I want for you to do. Okay, the next day he gets up and starts to go about it. Why wasn't there any kind of shock? Why wasn't there any kind of, wait, 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 stop, stop, time out, time out, clarification here. And, and there's many times where Abraham does that with God, so we know that he does that. Why didn't it happen here? And this is really really important because for those of us who are in this room, we look at this and think, that's insane. How could you possibly do that? It's so far from our culture. It's so far from our reality. It's so far from our experience. We look at it and say, you're going to sacrifice a child as a burnt offering? That's 
crazy. Now, now here's the thing. We're a little bit hypocritical in that because the reality is, is that in our culture, we sacrifice our kids for our gods all the time. But the idea that it would be a burnt offering, like that's, that's crazy. But this is one of the things that you need to know about the context in which Abraham finds himself. Because Abraham finds himself in the midst of a culture where this happened all the time. As a matter of fact, there were several of the gods that the Canaanites worshipped where they would sacrifice their children as burnt offerings to these gods. The god Molech was, was worshipped this way. There would be these huge altars that they would build and there would be this massive fire and they would literally bring babies and throw them into the fire. And there would be these huge drums that would be playing so you didn't hear the screams of the children. And this is what the people believed about God. They believed that this is the way that God was. Now, this is, this is very difficult for us to be able to comprehend because, you see, you've grown up inside of a culture that has Christian roots. And ever since Jesus and the story of Jesus began to infiltrate cultures around the world, the way that people looked at God and gods drastically changed. So you've grown up inside a culture where you think that God naturally is good. As a matter of fact, some of you believe there is no God because of the fact that you don't think it's good enough. And you you fundamentally believe that if you're going to be God, then you're going to be good. That is not the way that people historically believed about God or even thought about God. So even when you look at the Greek gods, none of them are good All of them are selfish and they're petty and they're angry and they're destructive. It wasn't until Jesus that that begins to change because Jesus stepped in and introduced an entirely new idea of God. He actually confirmed something that God is actually speaking into this moment with, with Abraham. But you have to understand, Abraham is inside of a culture that says, no, 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 God is angry. God, God just wants more and more and more. And the way that these cultures operated is, okay, we want good things from God, so we have to appease God. And so we're gonna bring God more and more and more and more and more and more more and if we bring him enough then we can appease him and then he will give good things to us and that's the way they thought about God that's the way they interacted with God and so if you really wanted to appease God if you really wanted to make sure that you got a good then you had to give him that the thing that was most important to you and so they would literally sacrifice their children And this is the culture in which Abraham lived. And if you think that that didn't impact Abraham, you're wrong. As a matter of fact, the the primary question, the primary question that God is trying to answer throughout the story of Abraham is not whether or not God exists. The primary question that God is trying to answer throughout the story of Abraham is whether or not Abraham could trust him. And so he's constantly saying, Abraham, I'm going to do this, and you can trust me, you can trust me. He's not not trying to prove his existence. He's trying to prove, no, no, I'm going to be faithful, which is very different than what Abraham had experienced, had, had heard about God. It's very different than the gods that men had made up. It's very different than the gods that he, that he was surrounded with, the idols that he was surrounded with, and the way that men had imagined God to be, and God is stepping in, and over and over again, he's breaking that down, breaking that down, breaking that down, breaking that down, and again, and this moment, God steps in and says, okay, I understand that you would expect this of me. And so he actually calls Abraham into it. And in doing so, and in doing so he does something really powerful. Now, Abraham, as he walks through this, again, he's, he's, he's working through, okay, who is this God? And, and, and what, is, what is he like And so he responds to him, but even in the midst of it, there are all these statements that we see that show Abraham's faith. So listen to how the story continues. Uh, Abraham's talking to his servants. He says, we will worship, and then we, and he's talking about him and his son, then we will come back to you. This is one of the first statements of faith. Abraham's like, I don't know what God, what you're doing, but I, 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 
I know that you're not like what I've experienced. I, I know that you're not like the other gods. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. But, but even as he starts off, he says, no, we will come back. And listen to how it continues. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. We're going to come back to this as well in a little bit. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, and this is another one of the the faith statements, God will provide the lamb. Now we're gonna come back to that in a moment as well. God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Again, he's, I don't know how this is gonna work out. God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what's happening here, but there's all these moments where you see Abraham. God, I I know you're different than what we've thought. You've shown me that over and over again. And, and, then, and then as they get there, it says, when they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. And this is amazing because it's the exact same thing. And so you still see Abraham like, okay, God, what? Uh, I, I'm following uh, He says, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And in this moment, in this moment, God does two unbelievable things inside of Abraham's life life. In this moment, he steps in, and as Abraham is preparing, he steps in, and he says, Abraham, Abraham, listen, listen, listen. I know that you still think that I'm like those other gods, but I want for you to know I'm nothing like them. I want for you to know I'm nothing like them. And not only only do do I want for you to know that I'm not here to take from you, but to provide. Because in this moment, in this moment, it it looks like, okay, no, it's just another God who's just going to take. It's just another God who wants more. It's just another God who's going to, but in this moment, he steps in and says, no, 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 no. I want for you to know something. I want for you to change the way that you think about me. I want for you to change the way that you think about how I operate. I want for you to change the way that you think about my character and understand something. I'm not a God who just takes from you. I'm a God who provides. And in this moment, I'm going to do that. But in a far more significant way, Abraham, I want for you to understand how far I'm going to go to do that for you. You, you, may, you, may have, you may have missed it as we walked through the story. Let, let me just, let me take you back. At the beginning of the story, what does God say? He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Do you know where Moriah is? Mount Moriah is where Jerusalem is. As a matter of fact, the temple is built on Mount Moriah. But God doesn't say, I want for you to go go to Mount Moriah. He says, I want for you to go to the region of Moriah to a hill that I'm going to show you. What many believe is a hill just outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And then he says, I want for you there to walk up that hill with your one and only son. And he's going to carry on his back the wood upon which he will be sacrificed. Does the story sound familiar to you? A hill outside of Jerusalem. Abraham, I'm nothing like what you thought. I am not one who takes from you, but one who provides. 
And one day, my son is going to walk up a hill outside of Jerusalem, carrying the wood upon which he will be sacrificed. But on that day, I will not step in. On that day, he will willingly give his life. Because I want for you to be home with me. He will willingly give his life to make sure that there's nothing that will ever come between me and you again. This is why in just a moment, he again confirms the promise. It says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your only son, I, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of all the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all the nations of earth will be blessed. And he says, no, no, Abraham, this, I, I want for you to know in this moment, I'm not at all like what you thought I was. And just in case there's any question, I want to give you a picture of exactly what is going to be done for you and I want for you to know what it will be like for me when I watch my son walk up that hill to climb onto that cross and give his life for you. This is unbelievable. Do you understand this? Do you understand how long before Jesus this took place you're talking about hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years before Jesus walks up that hill, you see the exact same thing because from the very beginning, God is communicating, no, Abraham, not only am I a God who provides, not only am I gonna provide in this moment, but through you and through your offspring, not this son, but another son, my son, through your offspring, I'm gonna bring together my family and I'm gonna bless the entire world, which by the way is you. He says, I'm not. I'm not a God who's here to steal from you. I'm a God who provides. And it's interesting because Abraham understood that this wasn't just about this moment. So, so listen, listen to what he says. Listen to what he names the place. It says, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. He, he doesn't name the place. Pay attention, pay attention. He doesn't name the place Abraham trusted because he understood, no, no, this wasn't about me. As he walks out of it, he understands, wow, the significance of what just happened, it wasn't about my, about my faith. And I have to imagine going into it, he was saying to himself, man, I've got some amazing faith. Look at me, I've got some amazing faith. But he didn't come out of it saying, wow, look at my faith. He didn't come out of it saying, wow, look at the sacrifice that I was willing to make. He came out of it and said, wow, look at how God provides. But he doesn't name it, the Lord provided. He names it, the Lord will provide because he understood this wasn't just about what just happened here. This is about what God's going to do someday. This is about how God is going to provide someday. And notice, notice what is it that God provided on the hill? He provided a ram in place of Isaac. He did not provide the lamb. Why? Because the lamb was yet to come. But the lamb one day would be sacrificed on that hill. It just wasn't that day. because it wasn't Abraham's son that was to be given. It was God's. And God screams throughout all of history. No, no, no. I'm not a God who takes. I'm a God who provides. And when I call you, when I call you to sacrifice, when I call you to sacrifice, understand, 
It's not because I need something from you. It's not because I want to take something from you. It's because I want for you to experience what Abraham experienced. I want for you to see me provide. And if there's any question about that, and in Abraham's life, he answered it in this moment. Abraham, if there's any question about that, I want to I put an end to that, and I'm going to put an end to it right now, right here in this place. And Abraham moved from there realizing, no, no, the Lord will provide. And that's Abraham trusting before Jesus actually walked up that hill. What about us who've actually seen him come through, who've actually seen that promise happened, who actually saw and have seen Jesus do that for every single one of us. And he says, no, 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 you don't have to be. When I call you to sacrifice, and, and, and listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. If, as we're on this journey, as we're on this journey with him, God is going to call us to live a life of sacrifice in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, Romans says that we're to live our, our entire lives as a sacrifice to him to give all of ourselves to him. But from the very beginning, God's been saying, Don't, I'm not doing that to take from you. you. You have to understand, I have something for you in this. And as we walk through this journey together, and as we continue to pray about, okay, okay, God, how do you want how do you want for me to be a part of this? And as we look at our commitment to this, the reality is, the reality is, is that God's gonna call us to sacrifice because sacrificial giving is what changes us. And we've been talking about, we wanna give in such a way that it changes us, that it shapes us, that it uproots us. He's gonna call us to sacrifice, not because he wants to take from us, because he has something for us. And don't get this wrong and twisted. And some people teach, well, no, no, he's gonna have you give and then he's gonna give you all of these other things and you're gonna be wealthy. And that's not what God promises at all. God, God doesn't say, okay, yeah, you give and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you wealthy. No, no, no. But he does promise this. He says, no, no, I'm the provider. And I'm telling you, when I call you into sacrifice, I have something that I want for you to experience of me. I, want, I have something that I want for you to experience as I use you. And there's all sorts of different ways that that shows up in our lives. But God's going to call us to step into sacrifice. And for Anna and I, as, as, we've been, as we've been walking through this, for us, it's been about our emergency fund. And, and we've, you know, we've known F, financial peace, yeah, that sounded like I was going to curse. We've known F, no, 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 we've known financial peace, university principles for a long time. Let's we'll take that one out. And, <laughs> but we have, we, we've known that and, and, and we've worked and worked and worked for years. I mean, literally years, because especially early on as planning a church, it just wasn't a reality for us, but, but to be able to work, to be able to get, okay, we can have our emergency fund and we finally have our emergency fund. And then as we're Working through it and praying through it, it seems like God's saying, okay, I want, I want to talk to you about this. And, and, and I'll be honest, there's times where I'm like, okay, okay, great. And then I get in bed at night and I'm like, oh, no, oh, what, what's happening? And I, I don't know. And I don't know how it's going to work out. And I don't know how it's going to, how it's going to play out. And I don't know, God, what are you, what are you doing? And, but here's what I've seen. And here's what all of us have seen. And we've seen it over and over and over again. And that is this, God does not want to steal from me. And when he calls me into that, I know that he's a God who, who provides and I know that he's got something for me in that. Any question to that was answered when his son walked up that hill carrying the wood that he would be sacrificed on for me. But for all of us, all of us, we have to answer the question. The question, the same question that Abraham had to answer. Can we trust him? Can we trust him? Can we trust him? That he is who he says he is. Is there really a question there? I 
I want for you to think of all the different ways that God's provided in your life. And you know when we talk about this, we're not, we're not just talking about finances. We're talking about all of the ways that God's provided in your life. Community, love, security, identity, all of these things that we've been talking about with home. Think about all of the ways. Think about all that he's given for you. When, when, I, when I take the time to think about that, I, I'm often left with just one thought. God, why do you put up with me? Because it just blows me away how over and over and over and over again he's shown. Not just in this moment with Abraham, but how over and over and over again he's shown. I can trust him. I can trust him. And I don't have to be nervous about it. And we don't have to be nervous about it. Because we know he's not just the God who has provided. He's the God who will provide. Will you pray with me? Father, You are, you are the God who has, you are the God who is, you are the God who will provide. And so as we come together today, I just pray, I pray that whatever it is that you're calling us to step into in sacrifice, that we would rather than being hesitant, that, that we would step into it with expectation, that we, would, that we would be the one who says, here am I, here am I. Because you've shown, you've shown that you have not come to take, but to give. That you have not come so that we would be left without, but so that we could come home. And home is exactly where you've brought us. In Jesus' name.